Hello, boys and girls, and welcome to today's lesson, which is the French and Indian War. While we get ready, you can go ahead and press pause, set up your Cornell notes for today, which uh, will include the date, the title, and the page number. Gather your supplies, and while we wait, you can also read our content and language objective. Don't forget to always update your table of contents. So go ahead and press pause, get that done, and then when you're ready to go, you can press play again. Let's go ahead and review a couple of the key points that we've been discussing in the era of exploration and colonization. Starting off with the original 13 colonies, we all know that they were established for different reasons. We know that there's three regions, and a region is a place with similar characteristics. We have the New England colonies that were set up uh, primarily for religious reasons. These were individuals who were escaping persecution, seeking religious freedom. Now, always keep in mind that a region, like I mentioned, is um, similar because it's made a region because of its characteristics. So the climate plus the geography will determine their economy. So in the New England colonies, Cold weather, rocky soil, dense forests, swift rivers, natural harbors, all of that determined their economy, which included fishing, shipbuilding, whaling, fur trade, uh, timber. Uh, so just keep those things in mind as we move further down. We have the middle colonies with a mild to moderate climate, uh, good soil, rolling hills. Their economy was focused on grains, so they were known as a bread basket colonies. One of the most important colonies in this region is Pennsylvania, founded by William Penn, and this is where you have your Quakers. And if we recall, our Quakers are all about peace, they're pacifists, they're about love, right, God, and equality, which means they believed everyone was equal under God's eyes. They are your first reform movement leaders against slavery, your abolitionist. So finally, our five Southern sisters, our Southern colonies, these will remember that they're the Southern colonies because all the names sound like girl names. So Mary, Maryland, Virginia, North and South Carolina, I like to call them the twins, and then of course, Georgia. These colonies have hot weather and very flat, fertile soil that is perfect for their economy, which is a cash crop agriculture. They, they uh, had tobacco, rice, indigo, cotton, and in order to meet all those demands of the plantation system, they needed slave labor. These are our three colonial regions. Now, as the colonies continue to grow and they're living their lives, they start to develop a self-government. Uh, there's a growth of representative and self-government. We need to know the causes that led to that growth and what are those institutions that were created that essentially became the model for future uh, legislatures. So because of the distance from Great Britain, they're 3,000 miles away, slow communication, because they needed to be able to make rules and laws and have those town meetings where they had those conversations. And finally, because the king was practicing something called salutary neglect, he was ignoring them. They were happy about that. That growth slowly started happening in the 13 colonies. So what are some of the things that were created? The Virginia House of Burgesses, which is the first representative assembly. Uh, the Mayflower Compact, which was signed by the Pilgrims, the first social contract, and the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut that was created by Thomas Hooker after he left Massachusetts and created his own colony for religious freedom, which is Connecticut. So, and the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut are important because what it did is it expanded suffrage voting rights beyond church members. And all of these ideas actually came from England from different documents such as the Magna Carta and the English Bill of Rights, all right? So what is the economic policy that England has imposed on these 13 colonies? It is mercantilism. Basically, they could only buy and sell, which is import and export to their mother country, England. The 13 colonies would export their raw materials and then England would manufacture those into finished goods and sell them back at higher prices. The, the whole overall idea of mercantilism is that the mother country is controlling their trade, all right? So keep that in mind because later 
in the future, you're going to know that once the 13 colonies become the United States of America, they don't want to do something like this. They want something called the free enterprise system, where there's not a lot of governmental control on them and their businesses. So let's go ahead and read this question. How did mercantilist policies create tension between Great Britain and the colonies? Keep in mind, what is tension? Think about a rubber band and slowly pulling it apart. And every time a problem or an issue happens, that tension, it gets tighter and tighter and tighter. Eventually, what's going to happen to that rubber band? It's going to pop. That's, that's going to create the American Revolution. That's the idea. So again, how did mercantilist policies create tension between Great Britain and the colonies? F, by introducing indentured servitude to the middle colonies. G, by requiring colonists to enlist in the military. H, by limiting the amount of farmland each colonist could have. Or J, by preventing colonists from trading with most other foreign countries. So I hope we were all able to answer J, by preventing, not allowing colonists from trading with most other foreign countries. So they did not let them trade with other countries. That's that control that England had over them. What else developed the transatlantic slave trade? In order to meet the economic demands of the plantation system, they needed slave labor. So they were acquiring that slave labor from Africa. What did Africa want in return? They wanted rum. But in order to make rum, they needed sugar and molasses. So this is the trade system that we saw. Africa exported slaves to the West Indies. The West Indies exported the sugar, the molasses, and the slaves up to the colonies. The colonies used that slave labor for their plantation system. The sugar to create the rum to continue the cycle, the trade system. Let's go ahead and take a look at what we're doing today. Our content objective says... I will identify the significance of the French and Indian War. Our language objective, I will complete a graphic organizer of a before and after map of European land claims of North America. But before we get started, I want to show you how easy it is to learn what the French and Indian War was and what are the effects, which is actually tomorrow's lesson, all in 32 seconds. French and Indian War, French and Indian War, Appalachian Mountains. Appalachian Mountains, colonists couldn't move west, Indians would attack them, Proclamation Act, Proclamation Act. England lost money, lots and lots of money, so they were in debt, so they were in debt. Sugar Act and Stamp Act and the Quarter Ring Act, England wanted payback, so they made taxes. So in 32 seconds, you got today's lesson and tomorrow's lesson. So I'm going to play it back one more time. And I want you to identify what was the French and Indian War. And for tomorrow's lesson, what were the effects of the French and Indian War? Because of this war, what happened and what did that lead to? So here we go. French and Indian War, French and Indian War, Appalachian Mountains, Appalachian Mountains. Colonists couldn't move west, Indians would attack them, Proclamation Act, Proclamation Act. England lost money, lots and lots of money, so they were in debt, so they were in debt. Sugar Act and Stamp Act and the Quarter Ring Act, England wanted payback, so they made taxes. So the French and Indian War was a war between France and Native Americans, so they're together, versus the 13 colonies, England, and they also had Native Americans on their side. So these Native Americans that were on both sides were actually enemies with each other. This is the effect of the, one of the effects of the French and Indian War. You'll notice a before and after map uh, of North America. So in 1754, you'll notice that the British colonies stretch to the Appalachian Mountains. Versus after the war, the colonies are going to stretch all the way up to the Mississippi River. So as I mentioned earlier, the French and Indian War was a war fought between 1754 to 1763 in the New World. And the New World is North America. So go ahead and press pause. 
write your notes, and when you're ready to start again, go ahead and press play. What initiated the French and Indian War? Remember that the word initiated basically means what started, what's the first, all right? So initiated, what started the French and Indian War? North America looked like this. The British colonies stretched all the way up to the Appalachian Mountains, so from the Atlantic coast to the Appalachian Mountains. And France was from the Appalachian Mountains all the way to up to around the Rocky Mountains. They did cover the entire Great Lakes area as well. Now, the French came to make a profit in the fur trade business. They were trading fur. They became friends with the Native Americans. They depended on the rivers that provided access to the sea and French markets. Soon, the British began to encroach on the French fur trading territory, and they challenged the French land claims. What that means is the British started to cross those Appalachian Mountains and go into French territory and start to trade with the Native Americans there. They even started saying, no, this is our land. So you started to get that tension building up between the French and the, and the British colonists. The French and the British were building forts in preparation for a war because of this dispute over that land claim. Now, France and England hate each other. This is called old world drama. They've hated each other for a long time. They're, they're, they're neighboring European countries. They both want that Ohio River Valley area, that land between the Appalachian Mountains and that Mississippi River. Why? Because it's very profitable. It has an abundant abundance of natural resources. It's valuable land. Go ahead and press pause as you write your notes down. Now, during this time, as all this arguing and tension is building up between France and the 13 colonies, Benjamin Franklin famously draws his political cartoon. He drew one of America's first editorial cartoons. It urged the colonies to unite against the common threat of liberty. He created this snake that represented the 13 colonies that were basically separate and apart. They were not united. And he started the idea. He kind of planted that seed for future, for the future, saying maybe we should join together in one common government. This was known as the Albany Plan of Union. We should join together into one general government because France is coming over. And if we're not prepared, if we're not united, we're going to die. England decided to send weapons and supplies to the 13 colonies, including soldiers, because he knew that that land across the Appalachian Mountains, the Ohio River Valley, was very profitable. And if his colonies made money, he made money. Remember, mercantilism. So he sent soldiers, supplies, and weapons to North America to help fight against the French and Indian War. Now, all of those things that are being sent over, they all cost money. It's all expensive. They all have a price tag to it. So ammunition, cannons, guns, uniforms, shoes, and a food, all of that costs money. And England is the one spending all that money to defend the 13 colonies against France. Go ahead and write in your Cornell notes. You can press pause. And when you're ready, I'll be waiting for you here. Just press play again. The fighting ensues, the war starts, France versus the British colonies and Britain and Native Americans on both sides. One thing that both France and Britain were not ready for was the, the battle styles, the battle tactics that the Native Americans had. They didn't have rules of engagement, which are rules of war. They just fought, which were known as the guerrilla warfare. They just fought without any rules whatsoever. And you can see that in this image. While the British and the French were used to having their, their rules, right? Marching in straight lines, fighting in open fields. So this was something very new and different to the European countries. Here's another picture that shows we're not fighting in open fields saying, hey, with drums, are you ready? Yeah, we're ready. You're ready. Okay, let's fight, right? And everybody was in lines. They were fighting in forests behind trees. This was known as guerrilla warfare. And who wins? Britain and the colonies. 
they win the French and Indian War. Now, Britain wins all of the land west of the Appalachian Mountains up to the Mississippi River. This is the Ohio River Valley. Later, we're going to call this North, the Northwest Territory. So now, Britain, the British colonies stretch from the Atlantic Ocean all the way to the Mississippi River. So go ahead and write these notes in. Alrighty, boys and girls, let's go ahead and grab our handout, which is the French and Indian War. It looks like this. And let's gather our supplies. We're going to need crayons, colored pencils, markers, whatever you feel more comfortable using. For sure, the color orange, green, red, blue as well, and maybe brown when we identify the mountains. So press pause, make sure you have your supplies next to you and ready to go as we continue with our last activity. One of the effects of the French and Indian War are the European land claims and how they changed. A war, you're always fighting for something. In this case, they're fighting for land. The land they were fighting for was a land between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River, also known as the Ohio River, later called the Northwest Territory. So we're going to be seeing one of the effects of the French and Indian War today. And tomorrow, it's all about all the additional effects that the French and Indian War had. Some of them are long-term effects that end up causing uh, the American Revolution. Start by identifying the oceans. As we're doing this, if I'm going too fast, the great thing about this is you can press pause, complete it at your own pace, and then press play as to, to continue the activity. So I'm gathering a blue, and I'm going to color in the oceans right here. And we're going to identify them in a bit. So go ahead and start coloring it in. Here we have some great lakes. Go ahead and identify this. This is the Atlantic Ocean. And over here on the west side, you have the Pacific Ocean. What I also want you to do is draw your compass right here. North, south, east, west. That's always very important. Now I'm going to continue with uh, rivers. So I'm going to draw my river right here, which we all should know is the Mississippi River, the longest river in the United States. The one that branches out is the Ohio River. And out of that to the west is the Missouri River. So I'm also going to identify them, which is write them in, label them. So here we have the Mississippi. Oops. the Ohio, and the Missouri. If you need to, press pause if I go too fast, but make sure that we've identified those, as well as we should all know what these are. Of course, it's not great. There should be five. These are the Great Lakes. Once we've done that, let's start with our mountains, which are important because mountains become boundaries and it becomes difficult for colonists to cross these. So I'm going to draw my Appalachian Mountains all across here and I'm going to label them. And I'm also going to draw my Rocky Mountains over here. Go ahead and do that. If you need to, of course, press pause. Now I'm going to start identifying my European land claims. So I'm going to start with Spain and I'm going to use orange, which kind of looks a little bit like um, yellow, which is fine. And I'm going to start with the first one which is here because they originally landed in the West Indies. And so they settled all of present day Florida as well. Then they stretched all the way across something like this. Of course, it's not correct, but we're pretty close. We want to know, generally speaking, where they're at. And they got all of present day Mexico. This is Spain. So I'm coloring it in yellow, orange, sorry, orange. And I'm coloring the little box orange also. One way to always remember if they, in the test, they give you 
the lands and maybe they give you cities. If the cities sound like Spanish or religious, then you know that those were the original Spanish land claims. So here in this area, we have places like in California, Los Angeles, which is Los Angeles, right? Well, angels, religion, they set up Catholic missions to spread Christianity. In Texas, we have um, San Antonio, which is a saint, right? Saint Antonio. So moving on, those are just little hints that will help you remember this information. So this is Spain. Go ahead and press pause if you need to, but I'm going to move on to France. So let's continue with France, and I'm going to be using green for France. And, and they went from west of the Appalachian Mountains around the Great Lakes area. Specifically, they settled that area because of the abundant natural resources that it had all here. So that is your French territory. So I'm going to color in France here as well. Make sure that if you need more time, you press pause to complete it. So for British land claims, these are your original 13 colonies, and they stretch from the Appalachian Mountains, east of them, all the way up north to and all the way to the coast, the Atlantic coast right here. So I'm coloring in Britain. This is what North America looked like before the war started, before that fighting for the Ohio River Valley started. Now let's look at, well, how does it look like afterwards? So what I'm going to ask you to do next is to press pause and I want you to draw in all of our physical features of North America. These are your mountains, your rivers, and your oceans, and of course the lakes as well. So here are my oceans. I labeled them the Atlantic Ocean on the East Coast, the Pacific Ocean on the West Coast, and I also put my compass. So make sure you've done that. Now I'm going to continue with the rivers. Remember that at any point, if I'm going too fast, which I probably am, press pause. So now I've identified the rivers and lakes that are most important in this lesson for today. So you have the Mississippi River, the Missouri River, the Ohio River, and then we have our lakes. This is the Great Lakes region up there at the top. There's five Great Lakes. So here are my mountains, and I even added this time around some brown shading just so that it, you can tell, you can differentiate. I've got the Appalachian Mountains on the East Coast and the Rocky Mountains on the West Coast. So now, check this out, boys and girls. Where France used to be, they've been, they are now officially gone for the time being. Later, they come back, right? But for now, Spain has encroached, has gotten over and claimed all the land up to the Mississippi River. Now, like I said, France will be back. But for now, this is what the Spanish land claims looks like. So there's not going to be any France for now. This next territory, Britain, you're going to notice that Britain is now going from the Atlantic, crossing the Appalachian, reaching all the way up to the Mississippi River. So this is what the North American European land claims look like at this time after the French and Indian, Indian War. Britain has stretched from the Atlantic all the way to the Mississippi. France is no longer here for now. They later come back and this and Spain has kind of taken over that land for the time being. So this wraps up the lesson, boys and girls. Thank you so much for following along and for completing it. I appreciate you very much and uh, we'll see you next time.